Yeah. All right. Welcome, everybody, to uh, this Thursday edition of TechTO Health. We have an amazing lineup of panelists here with us today. Uh, my name is Maggie Bergeron. I'm a physiotherapist in Toronto, and I'm the co-founder of Embodia, which is an online education platform and tele-rehab platform for healthcare professionals, mostly physiotherapists and rehab pros. And I'm your community director for TechTO Health. So again, thanks for joining us for this lunch hour session. We're super excited to be here. And today we're gonna to be talking about mental health. Mental health both for uh, ourselves as either healthcare practitioners or health tech founders or those involved in health tech companies, and also uh, what is out there currently in terms of mental health platforms. So uh, for those who are new to TechTO Health, we are a community of both healthcare entrepreneurs and innovators and healthcare practitioners. Uh, of course, normally we have in-person events, but recently we've been adjusting to these awesome online events where you get to hear from a different uh, panel each week, different topic, and we have some amazing networking. So uh, today we're going to hear from uh, Arash, who's the co-founder of Inkblot, Mosin, who's the medical doctor, CEO and president of OPTT, and Joseph, who's a psychologist, educator, and innovator. And we're so excited to have all of you here with us. I'd love to uh, just get a bit of an introduction from each of you. So if you could introduce who you are, uh, where you're coming from, because this is also the great thing about online events is that you can join from anywhere mm -hmm. and uh, the work that you're doing. And uh, let's start with Mosin. Oh. Hi, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, me. Um, my name is Mohsen Omrani. Um, I'm a medical doctor and a neuroscientist. And uh, I'm currently in Kingston. And uh, we develop a platform uh, for delivering online psychotherapy uh, targeted at healthcare organizations so they can bring uh, you know, digital mental health support to their uh, patients at one for the time and cost. So our goal is to uh, lower the cost and uh, make mental health more accessible for patients. Amazing, thank you. Thank you for being here with us. Uh, Joseph, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Maggie. Uh, this is my first time at a TechTO event, so I'm, I'm quite pleased to be uh, here sharing the stage with uh, some very talented individuals and I'm as eager to learn uh, as everybody else uh, in, in uh, and stands as well. So my name is Joseph DeLeo. I'm a clinical psychologist and uh, specialized uh, in areas related to addictions, trauma, and uh, dealing with chronic disability. Um, I can tell you what I'm not. I'm, I'm certainly not an expert in technology, uh, design, or development, um, but I do express a very strong interest in uh, technology-enhanced therapeutic approaches, and I've had the privilege of working on several different teams supporting the development of mental health and virtual care programming for various specialized settings and populations. So um, this is a change in time, no doubt, and I think this is a, a prime opportunity for us to have these meaningful discussions, and I look forward to it today. Thank you so much for being here. And Joseph, I just want to point out that you are kind of like at, right at the intersection of both the healthcare innovator and implementer, which is, so you're kind of like the mix of what our community represents, and it's wonderful to have you here. Thank you. And Arash. Uh, let's hear sure. a little bit about you. Uh, hi, everyone. It's great to be invited, and, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, I'm a family physician. I do eMERGE. I do psychotherapy. So I do a lot of clinical work. I'm also the co-founder of Inkblot. Um, our goal is to really make mental health care um, as evidence-based and accessible as possible. 98% um, of the, the care is done virtually. Um, and we operate in all channels across North America. So, um, so I'm happy to speak to um, either what's going on with COVID, mental health stuff, um, meditation stuff, and also the entrepreneurial side of things in health tech. Amazing. So I'd say really all three of you are actually quite at the intersection of um, our community. So as medical professionals, innovators, and uh, Mosin and Arash as being uh, founders of two amazing tech platforms. So let's start off, let's just kick off this conversation, uh, of course, acknowledging the challenging situation and unprecedented, unprecedented situation that we're in right now that none of us have ever dealt with. Uh, what has been some of your experiences so far 
in uh, in your work in either helping patients or helping your your clients in the companies that you're running? Um, I, I could go uh, first. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, the, the thing that uh, is interesting is that uh, Arash could attest to this. Uh, uh, this virtual care uh, platforms have been trying to be, you know, and uh, telemedicine uh, has been around till for the last 10, 12 years. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, it hasn't uh, uh, received the attention and, the, you know, the welcoming that it deserves because it, uh, you know, it can save a lot of cost. It can, you know, change uh, the distribution of the care. It can change the quality of the care. Uh, but uh, one thing that I should say uh, about, uh, you know, this COVID situation is the rapid switching from everything in person to everything virtual, right? Uh, so every meeting has been, uh, you know, uh, canceled and now it's done, been done on Zoom and TechTO is happening online. And uh, I should say there has been a similar interest, uh, you know, in our platform as well. That you know, a lot of um, right now, especially like psychiatric uh, um, meetings, and are done online, whether by phone and uh, by video. And uh, so I, I would say it's. I mean, the, the silver lining is that uh, virtual care is getting the attention needed. Uh, that's uh, the business side, but uh, I think uh, the fact that we are all isolated at home and some of us with kids, you know, uh, it's quite challenging as uh, everyone can guess, you know, handling kids and, you know, not being able to hang out with friends and everything. So that, that uh, uh, you know, puts it toll. I can follow up from that. Um... At least on my end, it's certainly been eye-opening and uh, challenging for a variety of reasons as we kind of all collectively adjust to the disruption um, and also acknowledge that for many it's quite tragic and will involve a significant loss. Um, so um, it, it is an opportunity in, in many respects to um, kind of reorient to things that are, if you will, essential. Um, certainly, we might, I might describe this as a non-ordinary experience, at least in my lifetime. And yet I recognize that uh, no doubt adversity is all part of our lived experiences. So it may not be for everyone uh, who's, who's perhaps um, come from uh, places in the world where conflict and adversity is more common, but clearly we're all in this together. And I think that's um, a theme that's emerging in all of the conversations I'm having uh, in my family life, uh, uh, with my clients, uh, my colleagues and peers, mentors. Um, and perhaps a consequence of these experiences is that uh, their consciousness expanding. And what I mean by that is that we cannot help but think about kind of the facets of our experience that perhaps at a time were entirely out of our awareness. I mean, um, and, and it's not surprising that we're now reacting to this, this new, uh, new normal, or this new reality. And the challenge really is in now figuring out how to move ahead with this new biological reality in mind. Right? Like it's, um, it's, it's very interesting, as, as uh, Dr. Omrani was mentioning, uh, just a few weeks ago, things were, the landscape was quite a bit different. And then within a few days, um, I wasn't allowed to make contact, or at least it wasn't appropriate to, based on recommendations. We we're finding other ways to beat each other with the elbow bump. And then we were adjusting to that because people are using their, their sleeves to cough. And so it's, it's, it's um, um, there are, I guess, ways in which we might find some humor um, in, in uh, how quickly things can change and the absurdity that can follow from that while also coming to terms with the reality of the circumstance. So I think for me at this point, uh, it, it's, it's an opportunity really to learn on how we might facilitate social medicine um, and, and leverage some of the existing technologies that, as uh, Dr. Mani mentioned, have been around for some number of years now, uh, but really with an imperative to figure out how best to ensure they're accessible to individuals who might, um, who might benefit from them at this time. Yeah, um, I have lots of thoughts. Uh, I'll start off by saying that this, the whole situation is horrible. Uh, like this is a shitty, terrible situation. I think we kind of just need to state that as is. This is a, this is a, you know, a dystopian world that none of us really expected or, or, or 
of football play out this way. Um, and I think having, you know, a lot of patients that I've known for 10 years passed away from it and, and be really affected by it um, has been has been tragic. I think the most tragic part, to be honest, is the fact that family members couldn't be by their side. Um, I think that is uh, super traumatizing um, for, for family members, uh, people who have been unable to have funerals um, because of those. And, and, you know, like those are some of the staple rituals that people have. Uh, weddings being canceled on a different note. There's, there's a lot of things that um, I think cannot be under, uh, understated. I think we are all in a bit of a state of shock right now, not really sure what this all means. Everybody's in a different state. So some people who are employed and they're very busy with work, um, it's, a, it's a very different experience than those who are disabled and isolated and worried about their kids. Um, so, so the first thing I'll say is that just like anything, this trauma is, I find, really affecting different people in very, very different ways, um, which, which is expected um, because we're a diverse population. But um, it's, it is pretty horrible. Um, from, a, from a founder perspective, which is health TL, health, uh, <laughs> which, which is kind of the, uh, the focus here, it has been interesting. So uh, as, as most have mentioned, it has, like, for us, it's caused a 1,300% increase in all metrics. Things have suddenly exploded. Um, so from a business perspective, um, you know, it, it has felt like we were selling electric cars, and one day gasoline was made illegal. So it's, it's the, quite the problems that you're trying to solve now are very, very different. Um, you're, you're, you're now trying to... Uh, scale things at a very different rate. You're trying to onboard in a different way. You're trying to automate in a different way. Your uh, focus is very different. The conversations are very different. Um, and interestingly, the product uh, direction also has changed. So um, before we were very focused on individuals and now at a larger scale, it becomes more groups. So now um, I'm doing group debriefing and group therapy with uh, frontline healthcare workers with uh, employees with those on disability. So um, the the other interesting part of this is from a from a product market fit. Uh, the market is different now, and it's not just that the market is more open to technology and and virtual stuff. It's that the needs are actually also different than they were before this. Uh, so mass mass trauma has a very different. It's a very different market, different problem set uh, than individuals within a population. Um, and, and it's been interesting having these conversations with large companies and large organizations trying to figure out what to do with it uh, and, and how to respond to it in a sensitive way. So um, I would say in different aspects of my life, uh, it has really played out slightly differently. But overall, I think we all still don't know what it all means. I think that's actually a really interesting point that you bring up, that um, the needs are different. So not only, I like your analogy of uh, gasoline being illegal and now we only have electric cars as an option or we only have virtual as an option which has really accelerated the pace of um, adoption of technology but also that needs are different so would uh, Joseph or Mosin like to comment on that? Um, yeah uh, so well the, the problem is that uh, the need was quite high even to begin with right it was not that we were in a really good situation and we just got worse right no we um, mental health was quite uh, you know problematic beforehand so um, one in five uh, people essentially are dealing with mental health uh, you know living with mental health problems and but so that makes around 50 million people in us and canada but more than 60% of them do not seek care for the, you know, for their problem. So it's like uh, around 30 million do not seek any care, uh, care for their problem. So it's not like that, you know, we had a good system uh, and this mass trauma is uh, just, uh, you know, adding to it. It, it was a you know, broken system already. Uh, and this is just, uh, you know, would be the last straw if uh, you want uh, to put it on. Because uh, as Arash mentioned, now, um, you know, with people, uh, you know, being in isolation, a lot of addictive behaviors have been, um, you know, resurfacing. You know, a lot of uh, people, uh, the use of alcohol uh, has increased like around 30% over the last two weeks, something like that. 
a lot of addictive behaviors are uh, changing, you know, the eating disorders and all of the stuff um, which are uh, exacerbated through isolation. Uh, and that is not considering, you know, the challenges of grief, for instance, you know. Um, we are very lucky, uh, I think, in Canada that the numbers are nowhere close to what we see in the U.S. Uh, like, uh, you know, I would expect something similar to New York uh, from, for Toronto, but thankfully that's not the situation. But just think about what um, uh, tr uh, New York goes through. You know, most probably with seven, 8,000 people already dead, you know, most probably everybody knows somebody who died from this, which is uh, traumatic. And, uh, you know, that should be addressed. And uh, so uh, there are different aspects of this. And the question is that where do we find uh, the capacity to address something which was already broken, right? So that's uh, the challenge that I think especially makes it more uh, important for the technology to kick in and use those um, methods uh, that before it was thought to be luxury, but now is the necessity to uh, incorporate it. Yeah. Uh, do you want to add to that, Joseph? Yeah, I'll just add, I mean, I think it's an excellent question. It's a question that I'm encountering in a number of different settings. So there's clearly an urgent need to broaden access to effective uh, virtual care models um, and, and other digital platforms that might otherwise uh, provide supports for those in need of, of, of these specialized services. I think the key word there is effective. And um, this can be especially challenging um, when we're thinking about the appropriate framework in terms of the scope and limitations of certain applications that are being built and whether they're um, suitable for specific individuals and or conditions and context, right? So these things can vary if we're treating, say, common conditions like anxiety, depression, um, uh, where, as Dr. Mani mentioned, there's likely to be a resurgence of, um, of kind of uh, general vulnerabilities around trauma as well. Um, those might look like different types of approaches if we're, if we're doing a trauma-focused treatment as opposed to, say, providing uh, uh, appropriate supports for those uh, with a different, uh, say, clinical presentation. Um, there's also questions around formats of, of various types of, uh, of services provided, whether they be standalone or if they're hybrid, say a digital platform in conjunction with a the therapist, um, or if they're adjunct and, and kind of a, something like a self-help uh, approach. Um, and also the settings in which these take place at home. Um, there are some discussions now about how to uh, have our clinics support our, um, be supported uh, so rather, our clinic support our clients and have our uh, providers, I guess, reach them using telehealth and other types of telepsychology services. But there's so many challenges that come with these. And I think if we don't consider the question that you posed, maybe about need and how they vary uh, based on some of the uh, factors that I provided, uh, that, uh, that I outlined, it's, it's, it's going to lead to a lot of confusion and it may lead to less adoption of some of these services that are quite useful. Um, capacity is always an issue, so scarcity of providers. Um, so there's, there's that issue with an abundance of services. So different bottlenecks kind of present in different areas. Um, there's also implications for the quality of services that we provide. There's that urgency to get on board. Um, and yet, um, we, we obviously want to have um, a standard of care being uh, supported by the, the services that are being provided as well. There's challenges in aligning services with competencies of providers. Uh, even things like uh, informed consent can be challenging. Uh, discussing relative risks and benefits with clients using these uh, these modalities or these services um, uh, are a challenge. And lastly, I'll just mention just technological efficacy. I think we can take for granted. I was able to log into today's TechTO events without any difficulties, but I hazard that if I were to pass this off to someone close to my family, they may have needed a lot more support and perhaps um, would have encountered a different type of stressor just to um, kind of do the basics um, that we might take for granted in, in kind of a, um, a very internet oriented uh, space. Lots to consider there. Absolutely, there's a lot to consider and I'm gonna take a couple of questions from the audience. So for those who are joining us, please feel free to type in the chat as many of you already have. I will uh, pose your questions to the panelists. So there's, there's two questions here uh, around uh, just people 
currently not using services that are available. So I'm going to pose both of them because they're fairly similar. Mm -hmm. Any comments regarding why over 60% of millennials are not using their benefits? Um, and about 39% or specifically 39% of millennials have not sought any help. That's the first question. Uh, and let's start with that one and then we'll come back to the broader question after that. I, I, I'm I'm happy to speak to that. So there, there's uh, there's a lot of barriers and there's a lot of reasons, um, and and so so there's a lot of obvious barriers that we would think about. So stigma, people being worried about the insurance company would know about them, or employers will find out. Um, there's a lot of anxiety about, um, and there's a lot of um, poor experiences. People call numbers and one eight hundred numbers, and and they talk to someone and they feel dismissed and have just really bad experiences and so on. So there's there's definitely a lot of systems issues which uh, get in the way. There are a lot of business model issues that make these the incentivized utilization. Um, it's kind of like the gym. The gym would prefer I don't actually show up um, rather than I go every day and use their, their machines. So a lot of business models are that model where things get added on to people's benefits that, and, and employers may often even not be aware. Um, so a lot of the top down initiatives oftentimes, whether it's the government of Ontario, whether it's an insurance company, whether it's an insurance broker, often don't have much adoption because just on the, on the front line, the employee isn't aware of it or doesn't kind of, is not, does not know of it. Um, so th there's definitely a lot of um, business model and systemic factors that, that play into it. In general though, as people, we're not a, we, we're kind of a little resistant to top down things. So if I if I want to um, get a massage tomorrow, I'm likely to ask my friend, where did you go? What was that experience like? As opposed to look up an app that my insurance company has created for me that has a list of insurance and so on. Same with mental health solutions. It's very personal. And, and if, um, if it feels impersonal, um, it just doesn't have a high adoption. It doesn't have that experience. Mm -hmm. um, so really empathy is what it comes down to in terms of uh, people feeling that it's something from, from my perspective obviously it's something that is suitable for them so there's a it, to me there are many layers that play into that um, the other thing that i find and i would say is that we do assessments so when we onboard companies we do assessment of the whole workforce and uh, so we get a snapshot of how people are doing even if they were not seeking mental health services and so it is true that there's a huge delay between when people um, have symptoms and are suffering before they seek any help. And, and, and part of it is, um, you know, sometimes our mind feels so messy that to even try to express it feels like a burden. So at some level, I think there's a, there's a psychological barrier, um, barrier that we all have. Um, and it also, uh, there's a lot of guilt that comes with it. So, you know, similar to how cough is a symptom of a cold, um, guilt is a symptom of feeling down and anxious. And so that guilt blames ourselves for not being, um, for not kind of feeling better, not being better, or not doing better, et cetera, and, and all those aspects. So a lot of things that keep society the way, running the way it does, also leads to us really uh, not seeking help when we need it. I think that's also a really good point. Um, you know, many of us speak to ourselves the way that we would never speak to someone that we love. And we're so harsh on ourselves. Um, and there, there is another question here that I'll, I'll throw out uh, about technology addressing the basic fact that 60% of people with mental health issues don't seek help. So that's kind of um, just piggybacking on what you were saying there. So any other comments around that? So if I may ask, uh, add, um, are generally, um, you know, uh, an answer to this is that there are two major problems with why people do not really seek help. You know, one of them is accessibility, uh, and uh, the other one is insufficient and inefficient, you know, distribution of resources, right? So accessibility, it could be geographical, which is really important for a, con a huge country like Canada. Um, so, you know, uh, in the U.S., uh, around two thirds of the population lives in 3.5% of the land. And 120 million people live in the rest of 96.5%. Uh, uh, and, and that makes the distribution is like there are 
uh, around 43 people living in any Marla Square. And, you know, that number for Western Europe, with almost a similar number, uh, you know, population, is 430 something. So, you know, for you to allocate uh, resources to, you know, geographically, it's almost impossible in these big countries. And, you know, there are, uh, again, there are cultural uh, problems, uh, like a lot of the Im immigrants and refugees. Uh, there is stigma that Arash comp uh, mentioned completely, especially in, uh, you know, in adolescence and, you know, more public safety personnel like military or nurses or doctors, there is a huge stigma, right, around mental health for them and uh, how to seek uh, help for that. Uh, but the other part is, you know, that the distribution of the, you know, uh, resources is completely skewed. Uh, so first of all, it's not sufficient. In the US, there is one psychiatrist for every 11,600 uh, people. That makes it one psychiatrist, and knowing that you know every one in five has mental health problem, that makes it one psychiatrist for 2,300 patients, right? Like the most prolific psychiatrist could see like 400 patients, right? So we are a factor of five short in the resources. And then, the resources are not distributed, uh, you know, um, equally. So, for instance, there is there are sixty three psychiatrists per every hundred thousand people in Toronto, and there are only seven psychiatrists for every hundred thousand people living outside in lower resources area. So, although there might be psychiatrists, but they are not uh, seeing them. So, essentially, like a psychiatrist in Toronto would see 105 new patients and 76 follow-up patients, but a psychiatrist in a less resourceful area would see 233 new patients and around 200 uh, follow-up patients. So it's like, it's not like that uh, the psychiatrist in Toronto is working less, but a lot of that is going towards like the follow-ups, right? So the uh, government is actually paying money uh, you know, for somebody who has already been, you know, maybe 10 years uh, seeing the psychiatrist and, you know, just uh, paying the same amount that could actually be the, delivered to somebody who doesn't have any care. Mm -hmm. So that's the challenge that, you know, uh, essentially um, a lot of, uh, you know, countries are trying to, um, um, uh, you know, move toward value-based, uh, you know, services, right? So it should be that, you know, um, that there is a value, okay, you get your, um, you know, remuneration based on the outcome, not based on how many times you see this patient. So the idea is that now if we switch to this value based, then the technology could uh, kick in to make sure that, uh, you know, if we have had this uh, um, discussion, like if, it is, if somebody is uh, receiving uh, money for fee for service, why would they care that they see 10 patients 100 times or 100 patients, you know, or 1,000 patients. But if it is value-based, then you have to make sure that, okay, I give more and more value for the least amount possible uh, to get the, the same amount of money. Uh, so that's, um, uh, you know, how, where the technology could come in. But I can uh, explain later what is our solution to that. Uh, I don't want to take more time. Maybe I'll just add just a few points. I mean, I seem to be, as you mentioned, kind of more in the intersection where, uh, as a clinician, I'm a consumer of good services, right? So I want to be able to have um, a, a set of options I can offer to my clients. And uh, as was mentioned, there's, there just seems to be an information overload um, with kind of the, the proliferation of options. And um, they don't, there's no, I mean, the language and mental health language is, is a tricky one. I mean. There's a language of mental illness, there's a language of mental health, there's a language of mental wellness, um, and we're all kind of having our own um, interplay with uh, what, what resonates with us and what, what otherwise um, would be useful to communicate. I think to Dr. Zahur's point, um, much of the barriers can also be around um, having someone provide you guidance on, on, a, on a viable uh, service, right? So I had this experience with 
um, uh, ink blot. It was great. Check it out. Uh, that that holds a lot of weight, um, and that's something that I would like to be able to say as a clinician. Um, and admittedly, it's been challenging. Uh, part of what makes it challenging is that um, it's it's often not clear to me whether the services are predicated based on, I guess, a standard that I would expect uh, for any service I were to recommend. So I, I know that some of the folks on the panel today have actually gone through the, uh, the, the very prudent exercise of validating their approaches, or at least predicating their approaches on, on uh, empirically val validated treatment approaches for common conditions like depression, anxiety, trauma. Um, that goes a long way for me as a provider, because um, it's, it's a little different than just, say, recommending an app. It's uh, recognizing that someone might in fact be in need of a specialized service. And in light of the resourcing and capacity issues that Dr. Mrani mentioned, um, that's gonna be an ongoing issue. It's always been an issue, will always continue to be an issue. And this is the space where I feel like technologies can be in, uh, uh, leveraged uh, to enhance uh, or at least broaden access to effective treatments. Um, and um, I still think that our due diligence is in um, demonstrating the effectiveness of our approach. Um, and ensuring that the folks who are in my position are aware of its accessibility and, um, and also address the barriers that it might present to others. Right? Not everybody, as I mentioned, um, is uh, poised to be able to take advantage of certain services, but they might be another one. Uh, so um, it'd be great if there was a repository of empirically supported uh, technology enhanced treatment approaches that I could point to or at least point people in the direction of that they could benefit. Perfect, thank you so much for commenting on that. There's a question here about the virtual task force, virtual care task force. Are any of you familiar with it? Uh, I'm assuming that this is from the, the CMA, like the, 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 the task force, the Canadian task force, or, or is it like more of a provincial task force that? Uh, if Melissa could comment, just put in the chat, uh, which what you meant by virtual care task force. Uh, she's just asking about comments on how the task force addresses mental health, but useful to know which task force first. Uh, so, yeah, so, so I'm imagining that we the latest one went up in the CMA, so it was conjoined between different organizations. So the Canadian Medical Association and so on um, kind of was tasked with making recommendations. Um, I, I'm going to be very frank here. Uh, the, the, the oftentimes the, the, the task force, whether it is, um, it is for virtual care or it's for the, the healthcare of Ontario or whatever it may be. Um, we, you know, every year or two have a different task force that's providing a new set of recommendations. Uh, and they all sound great. They all sound, you know, we should have virtual care. It should be robust. It should be accessible. It should be in all languages. We could have, uh, all sorts of things happening. Um, the problem becomes oftentimes that um, what it doesn't address is the lobbying that happens. How should these decisions be made? How should these vendors be decided on? How um, should we, uh, you know, address those factors, the business side of it? So the the, the, the task force, um, I mean, we've lived through all of these. We've lived through several of them on a regular basis. Um, there's a lot of money spent. There's a lot of effort put into doing a landscape survey and providing very beautiful reports that speak to the heart of all of us. What they don't speak to is um, how do we control that those who have lots of funding, those who have had um, been, been in the system for a long time, who have a lot of lobbyists within the system, how do we con how, how is that being addressed? Um, the second factor that plays into it is that there are often monopolies that don't get uh, that are ignored. Um, that really stopped the innovation piece. Um, and the third thing I would say is that in Canada, we don't often, um, the healthcare system doesn't create a marketplace for healthcare innovation. So in the, in the US, if I come up with a new widget that makes diabetics 20% healthier, and I'm able to demonstrate that, and I insurance companies would love to pay for it and approve it and make it part of people's plans. In Canada, OHIP billing codes don't change. Uh, just because something is going to improve throughput through an emergency room, uh, it just doesn't happen. So there's there's this disconnect uh, between uh, there's no marketplace for innovation that the healthcare system has uh, needs to create in my mind to really allow us to be at the forefront of of healthcare technology. And that speaks well to what I believe Joseph was saying before about having options to provide to patients based on their needs and what might be most suitable for their care. Uh, Josen or uh, Mosin, do you have a follow-up comment on that? Looks like Mosin's going to jump in. Well, 
uh, Arash is way more courageous than me. Um, <laughs> politics right. in this thing is just like unbelievable. You know, the, the, you, you know, I, I, it took me probably two years to understand how the poli politics in this works. And that has a huge impact. You know, uh, you, you would think that, you know, the outcome, the wellness of the society should be the primary goal. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, well, unfortunately, it is not. Uh, um, it, it gets uh, lost in the bureaucratic uh, system and the politics of uh, who gets what and all those stuff. Uh, so, uh, again, th there has been many good options for so long around, but, you know, there is this momentum that stops the movement. And uh, to be fair, I mean, you know, the, Can the Canadian system is really conservative and is really slow. I mean, I don't think anybody else in the world is using fax machines other than the, uh, mental, uh, the health system in Canada. You know, it's like faxing is being <laughs> so outdated in any other business, but it's still uh, used on a daily basis, um, you know, in the health system. So it, it is this kind of uh, both the politics and, you know, the conservatism, uh, you know, that holds the new innovation back. So it's like, doesn't really matter if there is a good solution out there. It is that, well, why should we switch? And again, that to me, it goes back to a lot of the uh, value-based, uh, you know, kind of uh, delivery of services. If you are not, you don't care if you, know, you receive the same amount of grants serving your thousand patients or ten thousand patients, why would you switch? You know, why would you add uh, more care to your system? Because you know that more patients, you know, means more trouble. Why would you advocate people to come in? Uh, so these are challenges uh, that. At the end of the day, this would translate into economical burden for the government. You know, it's not that like that that is going to go away. You know, if you do not, uh, you know, the, the burden of mental health problems on the Canadian economy is around fifty billion dollars a year. On the U.S. economy is five hundred billion dollars a year. So it's not like that that is going to go away it's it's going to uh, reflect itself as you know this uh, financial burdens at the end of the day mm -hmm. i could say more on this but i think the question uh, that dr zahur mentioned on which task force almost captures some of the confusion in some sense in that um at this point all every organization i'm uh, affiliated with is trying to either develop a task force or trying to get away with not um or etc so it's there is, um, I think, the complexity of the organizations that we work with and also uh, can obscure some of these exercises. And uh, to Dr. Omrani's point, if we were to incentivize people based on client outcomes, that could potentially bridge a bit of the gap. No doubt there's, there's, that's not a perfect way to approach things. But you can imagine that if uh, we were able to demonstrate that these, the embrace of certain technologies facilitated client flow and otherwise supported um, improved outcomes, and that businesses and companies were incentivized um, on the basis of that, there might be a, a greater push to to embrace innovation in, in a space where um, often that's uh, often we find ourselves kind of building the boat out at sea and then trying to fit things in um, that might otherwise address our limitations. And that's where sometimes I feel like technology is some, uh, sometimes um, queries. Oh my goodness, we're not able to do what we thought we were able to do. You know, are there any technologies rather than leading with what we know? has been demonstrated to be useful in space in, in kind of technological innovation in mental health care uh, uh, as, as a starting point, or at least as part of the early part of the process. Absolutely, and there's a question here about, again, kind of the structure and our healthcare system. Uh, with the remodeling of LINS and new provincial model of care, how is this going to affect mental health de uh, delivery and accessibility, if at all? Um, I, I I think that um, it's hard to say. So so I have again, it's, it's hard for me to tease apart the mental because I'm I'm I I work clinically. It's hard for me to tease apart just the mental health component of all the changes that are occurring at a, at a provincial level in Ontario. Um, I I think that 
the underlying feeling is that this will save us money and, and have more resources, and it's pretty unlikely. We've, uh, throughout the country, we go through these centralized, decentralized, centralized, decentralized. Uh, and in fact, at a given time period, you'll find different provinces are in different um, part of that journey. So Alberta will often be reverse of us. So they're decentralizing just as we're centralizing. And, and then we switch and then they switch and, and we go through this back and forth. Um, and I think it's a myth that there was all this money to be had from the bureaucracy of healthcare. Um, the most of the funding is going to healthcare workers. Uh, it's a human intensive um, industry um, where there are people moving people around and doing things to people and, and helping people. They're, they're, people are expensive. Um, so it's a, the, that's where most of the cost is. And so oftentimes we will centralize the bureaucracy and then decentralize it and come up with new pathways. Um, and this goes through its own cycle. Um, in terms of mental health, the government does seem to feel, uh, you know, special focus on it. And I would say this government has put more emphasis on it in the marketing material, at least, um, in terms of intentions. Um, where I've been involved in the weeds of what that means, um, it has been kind of trying to uh, speak to uh, just just give more money to current solutions for the most part. Um, so it's it's I, and I and I understand if if you are one of those current solutions, you need funding. I'm not in any way underestimating their need to, for for funding to be able to continue to do their great work. And everyone involved in this endeavor is is, is are wonderful people. So they work super hard to help those who are who are having a difficult time. Um, so all the NGOs, all the current organizations, I, they they do fantastic work, and I understand that it's really tough. Um, I do feel to really uh, change what happens, the Ministry of Social Services and, and Health needs to kind of start to collaborate a bit more. Um, so it's really weird that people who are most disadvantaged, who are on Ontario disability, um, who are uh, but they get funded through a whole separate ministry uh, and there's often political and, um, and and all these aspects that play out between those two ministries which is tragic so i feel at some level we need to recognize the social economic underpinning of mental health um, and the difficulties that lay there and start to fund things in a very different model um, so there are a lot of there are a lot of things i don't think the current reshuffling is going to dramatically change things either way to be fully honest uh, but I'm a skeptic just because I've seen this happen a couple times. Um, now, as to whether um, their emphasis on mental health or the current crisis will change things dramatically, we'll see how that plays out. Thank you so much. And I do want to get to one more question. Um, so I'm, gonna, I'm going to uh, move to that question. Unless, do uh, Mo Sinner Joseph, do you want to take 30 seconds to comment on Arash's comments? Maybe Joseph? Um, no, I mean, we can move to the next, next question. question. Yeah. I think that was really well said. Thank you, Arash. Uh, so the, the last question here is going in a bit of a different direction. Uh, the question is about fringe technology or methods that are currently, or other methods that are currently being utilized for mental health. Uh, there's been some talk about uh, MDMA and psilocybin, sorry if I'm not getting that right, to treat depression and PTSD. Where is Canada in regards to using these chemicals for the mainstream? I think this is Joseph's question. <laughs> um, all right, I'll speak very briefly to that. I, I, I probably could find myself very easily tangential talking about all these interesting things. But um, so, um, good question. Uh, if we think about the what technology is, I might consider that some of the use of psychedelics, uh, perhaps broadly, can be conceptualized as kind of sacred technologies or uh, technologies that have been. Uh, in practice uh, historically traditionally and indigenous practices as well um, so um, mental health right now is certainly um, in a space where uh, innovation and the use of improved tools are much needed um, there's a long history of research stemming uh, from the 19th late 1940s um, uh, that was unfortunately uh, kiboshed and silenced uh, uh, throughout the 90s um, demonstrating the efficaciousness and effectiveness of certain medicines like uh, LSD and psilocybin in addressing complex conditions, uh, addictions, issues, trauma, and so on. Um, so the status of this in Canada right now is in flux. Uh, some people have described this as a bit of a renaissance of sorts. Um, there's been uh, amazing research uh, going on at NYU and Imperial College 
and John Hop Johns Hopkins uh, University as well and recently was awarded I think a 17 million dollar grant to study the impact of psilocybin or at least to continue studying the impact of psilocybin in addressing um, uh, conditions that we know have a high mortality rate including things like tobacco use disorder um, and the results are extraordinarily uh, promising and uh, and uh, hard to ignore I would say um, as we understand, the climate in Canada as it stands and in the U.S. is a prohibitionary, or at least um, uh, there needs to be a, a certain exemptions sought out for individuals to work with these, these substances. So much of the research is relegated to the uh, institute, like the academic institutions. Um, uh, th there are several trials that are going on right now, FDA trials that are in advanced stages, phase three trials, looking at psilocybin uh, as a potential and its potential applications in addressing uh, MDD uh, and uh, treatment-resistant depression and other refractory conditions. Um, and as far as um, one place that we are starting to look at uh, is the use of ketamine. Uh, ketamine is um, a medicine that's been used in pain management strategies. And one of the adverse effects of ketamine historically has been uh, what I think others might describe as a psychedelic uh, effect. So that was seen as a side effect of, say, a pain treatment. Um, and so now others are starting to turn to explore ketamine uh, for its breakthrough properties uh, in addressing depression. Um, so uh, for me, uh, as, a, as a clinician, a provider who often is responsible for caring for individuals with longstanding uh, physical and mental health issues, um, who have in many cases tried the, the best standard of care or uh, even explored certain uh, technological tools that we're discussing, digital platforms and so on, they're often left um, uh, in need of additional support. Um, and I'm always on the hunt for better tools. And um, there is at least a, a wave of new data suggesting that some of the medicines uh, that were just mentioned, uh, psilocybin, MDMA, uh, ketamine, um, and others, might, be, uh, might have um, real important applications. And in, in, incidentally, maybe well paired with other digital uh, educational modules and cognitive behavioral therapy modules and so on. So I'll, 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 I'll end on this note and uh, I'll have to force myself to end on this note, but um, I will say as a clinical psychologist that the emphasis continues to be, at least from my perspective, on the provision of psychotherapy. And psychotherapy, as we've come to learn, uh, affected in addressing the complex conditions that we work with every day. And the medicine, uh, like psilocybin or MDMA, is a catalyst. It is to support the active components of psychotherapy. Um, there are others that are exploring it just for its medicinal purpose, uh, value in and of itself. I'm not one of those providers. It's just it's just not my foray. It's not my uh, expertise. Um, and so I would approach it in the same way that if I were to learn about some of the digital platforms that are being developed um, that have an, an evidence base, I would approach the medicines in the same way as I do those digital platforms as well to see if they can actually enhance the psychotherapeutic process that I'm in service of. If I may add a few words, as, and this is the neuroscientist in me. Um, so I started in neuroscience with the, thinking of the, with the, knowing the brain better, we can heal it better. And what became uh, you know, clear for me over the last uh, 10, 12 years is that we know so little about the brain uh, that the thought of you know having a medication to heal any situation considering the brain is really, really far-fetched uh, you know that and that is again because you know we uh, you know pulled some symptoms together and say this is depression right it's just like you know your monitor is off it could be 10 different things while your monitor is off it could be the light it could be the power of the computer or any other thing but you could you know if you try to address that symptoms together and not being able to really pinpoint what the problem is naturally the you know, medications that you use are not going to be uh, doing magic so it's like uh, there there is no uh, silver bullet here uh, on any of these medications, any of these chemicals uh, can definitely help to some extent in uh, specific cases, which again needs to be completely really narrowed down who would be, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, taking advantage of this and who wouldn't. Uh, but what uh, to uh, follow what uh, Joseph said, I think the technology is essentially 
uh, should be something that empowers the clinicians, right? Just like, you know, if we went back 60 years ago, probably each hospital had one ultrasound machine. Now, uh, right now you have uh, many people, you know, carry ultrasound machines with them. So the, there is the clinician, you know, we empower the clinician, you get better outcome. And I, I see the technology in mental health in the same vein, that the technology should be focused on empowering every clinician. You know, that's our, um, you know, philosophy in my company, that what I am uh, design is for everybody else to use it and improve their outcome, right, rather than having one center that, you know, provides care, you know, make it decentralized and let uh, other people use it and be able to figure out what the challenges are so we can address those challenges in the next step. Perfect. Thank you so much. And uh, just before we close out, I'm going to come around and ask each of you to provide your contact information and any uh, like a tweetable final closing thought. So 140 characters or less. Uh, and your contact information if you'd like to add any final thoughts. And after that, for everybody who's attending, we are going to open up some networking. So you can network on, on this platform if you haven't joined us on an event so far. And uh, next week, uh, we are doing this again. So each Thursday, 12 to 1, we're going to have an amazing panel, different topic. And uh, it's always free for insiders. So if you're a TechTO insider, all of these events are free for you. You can join. We have events every single day. It's just Thursday is uh, health. So TechTO health is Thursdays. And there are tons of other TechTO events happening. So if you're an insider, these are all free. If you aren't an insider, next week event is uh, only $5. So we're trying to make this as accessible and as affordable for everybody to be able to join us on these events. So insiders are free. And next week, it's five, uh, five bucks if you're not a member. Uh, let's go around the way that we started as well. So, um, Mosin, if you could share your contact information, maybe drop it into, if all of you could drop that into the chat as well, email or website. Yeah, or I just, uh, put the, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I, I really believe, uh, you know, what we have, mental health is a big problem. And the only way I can see to be addressed is the, use of technology and innovation, and there's no other way around it. 140, I assume. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. That's perfect. And I saw that you put your email in the chat. So perfect. Thank you. So and your website. Perfect. Uh, Joseph. I'm not sure I've ever been able to do anything in 140 characters. <laughs> um, uh, so I guess to keep it brief, um, just I wanted to preface by saying thank you to um, certainly our front uh, frontline healthcare workers and all those that are acting in support of each other during this time. So it doesn't stop there. It's really kind of a global thank you of sorts. Um, we're certainly in this together. Uh, as far as kind of keep keeping it brief, I'm, I might just say, you know, stop, pause, <laughs> take a deep breath, and uh, express your value. Uh, share what's important to you, to the people closest to you, um, and uh, support each other in, in, in a form of togetherness. So technology is certainly one way to do that, but there are plenty of others. Thank you so much, Joseph. And I saw you put your email in the chat as well. Perfect. Now, Rash. Yeah, I would say, um, you know, be, be vulnerable, keep it real, uh, hold hands, even if virtually, and let's get through this. Perfect. Thank you so much. And I believe you put your email in there as well. So thank you so much uh, for our panel for joining us. And thank you for everybody for attending. Again, these events uh, through TechTO are free if you are a uh, insider member. And next week for TechTO Health, if you aren't a member but would like to join, it's uh, five bucks to join. If you're a member, it's free. And next week we're going to be talking about security and privacy with an incredible panel as well. So keep your eyes open. We'll send out an email with that. And uh, we hope to see you next week. Right now you can head over to networking. And in the networking section, you'll be able to meet somebody new. and. Uh, you have three minutes to chat before you're moving moving on to the next person. At the end of the three minutes, if uh, you both would like to, you can exchange uh, contact information. So thanks again for joining. I hope everybody has a wonderful day, and I will see you next Thursday.